I'm Matt. I'm Kerry. We are the Stagmer Brothers of Baltimore Knife and Sword. Our work can be seen on film, Broadway, and at Renaissance festivals around the country. We're going to be building some of your favorite weapons, and some weapons that you've never seen before. This is Man at Arms, Reforged. We're really happy to be doing another Marvel build. This time we'll be doing the villain that everyone loves to hate, Loki and his powerful staff. I have a few things to draw for Loki's staff. This will be the top blade. This is somewhat of a lobster claw. And this is the bottom blade. So we're going to go ahead and get these over to John. He's going to get them plasma cut. Since Loki is the Norse god of mischief and confusion, I'm going to be using my Norse hammer. It's a Viking hammer made for me by Jim Austin. Do some edge beveling on the initial spear point, and then take it in and get it ground. Just finished forging the bevel. I went ahead and added some bevel in here and on here. I gotta go back and clean up my profile just slightly and then I'll redefine my edges a lot more on the grinder. You don't see Loki doing too much slashing or cutting with his scepter in the movies. But since we're ball and knife and sword, we're gonna make it razor sharp and have a lot of fun in the demos. What I'm gonna be doing next is I'm gonna use a burr tool in this die grinder to grind in the edges on this section here. On a modern knife, this area would be called a gut hook. Normally we do polishing after heat treat. In this case, in the movie, the flats on these pieces have a rough forged look. I'm gonna pre-polish the flats. I'm gonna take them through 220 before the heat treat. That way, after heat treat, I can brighten up the bevels and leave the flats you know, with that nice rough forged texture. As the piece is cool from being red hot, scale will form on the surface. That's the look we're going for, is that nice rough forge look as you see here. Now I'm gonna go back to the heat, reheat them, and quench them for hardening. You'll notice I put the points pointing out, that's because that's the thinnest point. Those will heat up quickest, get those up to temperature, and get them ready for quench. What I'm gonna do here is something a little different. Not only am I gonna buff my polished area, but I'm also gonna buff the flat here. It's gonna give us a really nice shine, make it look a little bit like a meteorite or something from space. I formed an egg shape for Loki out of wax, and now I'm going to dip into hot wax to put a smooth coating over. And what we're doing is creating a mold, and then we'll put glass into the mold. We're gonna take some found glass that we actually purchased just from a Goodwill. We're preheating it on top of the forge. It's cracking a little bit, but we're gonna slump it in on itself rather than just smash it. We'll have a little bit less air trapped when we do the slump into the mold itself. So it's already starting to slump a little bit. I'm just pushing it in on itself to get a little bit of safety for us. All right, let's rotate just a little. The thing to remember about glass is it's a fluid. It's always a fluid. It just depends on how much heat you give it as to how quickly it'll move. It's fine. It's fine, it's not gonna hurt anything. It's just gonna make it easier for us when we go to the kiln. We're just gonna melt it into a little bit more of a clump. Oh, that's so cool. Lauren provided me with a large egg shape. It's not quite the form that I want to be able to mount the glass. I'm just gonna go ahead and take it right to the sander. Before going to the kiln, we'll often go to a small oven, and that will allow us to de-wax the unit so that we don't have to burn all of the wax out inside of the kiln. After the flask has come back down closer to room temperature, I load the glass in the top. This will have to slump down inside. We'll move the flasks into the kiln where they'll go up to 1350 degrees Fahrenheit. After almost two days in the kiln, we can remove the flask and show the glass. In the staff form, rather than the shorter scepter form, there's actually an additional blade. This additional blade is held on with two small metal pieces. We went ahead and decided to forge those instead of just cutting them out and sanding them. Forging left these pieces a little bit large and a little bit rough, so Sam is just going to run over the sander, smooth them out, get them closer to form. We use the MIG to tack in place the small supports that hold this outside blade. They'll be welded into the main body. This will be one of the strongest striking places on this weapon. Rather than using clean tubing, we decided that we'd actually use black painted pipe. 
The advantage of this Schedule 40 pipe is that it's got a thicker wall since we have to do some grinding into it. Ilya's going to take this staff, he's going to flare the end on a stake with a hammer, and then to produce the reversing curve without any marks in the piece, he'll use a wooden hammer over the anvil. Hot brass brushing is a common blacksmith technique, but they don't ever usually do it with a power wire wheel. Since we made our central core of the scepter out of steel, we have to give it that brass color. Carrie lays on some heat with a torch as Sam uses a brass wire wheel to lay the brass onto the surface of the steel. The base of Loki's staff has a whole lot of design work. We're going to be achieving a lot of that with overlays, but I need to do some of it with cut work. I'm going to do that with the wizard. After cutting our first overlay pattern, Ilya uses a stake and hot raises it to shape. So we'll make the shape correct, and then we'll brass them, we'll weld them in place, and then brass them again to make everything even. After brassing many different overlays, I'm finally on my last one. There's a fairly thick central block that holds the blades. It has some additional pieces welded over top that also go in and hold the crystal and mount to the center staff. But it gives us a lot of strength since we're actually going to use this as a weapon. Using WD-40 and a torch, I blew the support to give it a darker look, more like in the movie. Terry uses the lathe to turn our scepter that will hold our glowing orb. Last night, Kerry made this fitting. He also took some round rod, he flattened one side of it, and then tack welded it on here, and while it was hot, he went ahead and coiled it around to give us that look. I get John to help me welding on this. I hold everything in place, make sure I have clearance for the crystal, and John comes in and welds it from behind with the MIG. We finally reach the point where we can begin to assemble this. We take the head assembly and weld it onto the staff. After welding, we quench the staff so that we can handle it. This is our hacked flashlight that's got the really hot LED. We're gonna drop it down in the pipe. It'll slide up into its mount. There's a lock on the back side that'll be covered by the plate. It rotates to turn on. Set our crystal in place. This will be set in silicone. And then this is the first of four top covers. And then there's four or five bottom covers that go in place as well. And they'll get tack welded and then they'll be brassed so that everything's matched. But before we do that, we'll make sure that we have all the finishes the way we want them. We've combined several different techniques here that are rarely used in the shop. The glass casting is something we've only done a couple of times before and took us several days. I'm really happy how this entire build came together. Click here to subscribe or click here to watch more episodes. Thanks for watching Man at Arms Reforged. We need to know what you want the guys to build, so tell us in the comments below what weapons you want to see next.